Done. Okay, is that better? Yes. Nice. That's good. Nailed it. Thank you for hanging in there. Um, okay, so I want to ask what isn't machine learning. Um, so as math underpins everything we do, um, they're kind of, I think you get to a point where everything is machine learning. So, you know, if you think about when you're a child and you're trying to learn to walk, um, it doesn't look that unfamiliar to, you know, when someone has reinforcement learning algorithms that are teaching something to walk. Um, so from an offensive standpoint, I think it's an important distinction because, you know, where offensive Offensive folks try to live in the realm of possibility um, rather than in a sort of a, a box that we, we try to define. So, you know, maybe if you start thinking of everything as machine learning, you're going to find more opportunities to attack machine learning models, use them in your ops, um, whatever that might be. Um, but for this attack um, in particular, you know, we're going to... Um, we're going to do a copycat model, uh, and I think this this kind of concept will come out as we go through it. Um, so I'm kind of tired of the name copycat model, so I'm just going to call them Pink Panther attacks from now on. Um, one, it's more fun. Two, it's still kind of cat-like. And three, I know Pink Panther involves a diamond that is always trying to be stolen. And preconditions for a successful attack, and these are pretty loose, um, are a representative data set. So, for example, in the case of an AMZ provider, um, we're looking for like PowerShell, um, VBA code, um, a big representative data set that we want to model. And we need the ability to get feedback from our target model. And this doesn't have to be direct output. So if you imagine that a model doesn't give you, you know, back a score, but it keeps it in a Windows event log, you know, you still get your hard label, hard label being a zero or a one. Um, so even if the model doesn't give you back output, there are still, um, you know, just due to the telemetry nature of our networks, um, it's more likely than not that somewhere um, outputs being recorded. So rather than you know maybe going directly at the model, um, try and think of some binary test that you can you can perform um, that is potentially outside of the realm of a machine learning model. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple attack uh, once you kind of get into it. Effectively, you know you grab a massive. Um, in this case, I've, we found a big. Um, PowerShell corpus. Um, so we there's like 400,000 scripts, um, and the the workshop, the lab piece of it, we'll talk about that. Um, effectively, you know, the scripts get fed into an AMZ integration, um, and this just came off of the Windows sample. So all it does is you know load AMZ.dll, instantiate the com object, and we feed it every script in that in that corpus um, and that gets past the defender um, or whatever AMSI provider that might be and it comes back with a score um, and we then we turn around and we just collect those scores offline and once we have you know we have known inputs and we know what the output um, defender thinks of the output um, we can, you know, model our model, and the hardest part about um, the hardest part about I think adversarial machine learning isn't the machine learning piece. You know, most of us don't have to invent math. Um, people, you know, much smarter than than myself um, have already done that for me. But what is difficult is the engineering piece. It's getting access to the right data. It's getting at, it's getting data in a way that isn't going to get you caught, or um, you're going to distribute your traffic accordingly, uh, and you can kind of fly under the radar. Um, in the future, you know, currently attackers kind of have free reign, and you know, get away with quite a lot of 
querying and noise in the network, that's not always going to be the case. And I think it you know, is helpful for us to start thinking about limiting our queries, thinking about information density of a command, you know, a ping versus a process list, for example. Um, you know, ping, you're going to get, well, if a host is up or not, or you're going to get TTL, which is going to tell the OS. Um, but a process list, you're going to get, you know, that and more. Uh, but it probably just depends on what you're after. And, you know, from a machine learning perspective, um, an offensive perspective, like anything can be modeled. So if defenders are using machine learning to model, you know, whatever logs they're looking for, um, there's nothing to say that we as offensive folks can't also use machine learning to, let's say, model C2 traffic or let's say you have semantic, you have some product that is blocking you um, and you can't quite pinpoint it, machine learning will be able to do that for you um, if you can set up the right experiment. And so even though you know, semantic's not using machine learning necessarily to look for C2, your C2 traffic, um, you can still use it to you know, find those relationships between you know, whatever domain or whatever callback interval um, that you're using against whatever product it might be. So I guess I just come back to the question like what isn't machine learning? Um, and in my mind, everything is machine learning if you kind of go back to the math, which is kind of fun. Okay, so in the lab, um, for the workshop, all the code is in there for you. So the first half you'll step through and it'll be, you know, very explanatory. Um, and then as we go through, you know, it'll be less and less um, explanation. So you'll be, you'll be required to kind of look more, ask, ask more questions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, break stuff, like you, you're not going to break it. You can always reset it. Google it. Um, ask us for help. Um, AI Village has easily probably the highest concentration of some of the smartest people um, in the industry and I don't know there's so many PhDs and um, super experienced people so you know we love talking I like talking offensive ops but you know um, a lot of people like talking stats and um, topology and, all, and homology and all this other stuff um, you know the other day I learned that there was more than one algebra um, but yeah, so you know, this is the place to ask, so go ask for it. <clears throat> um, as you go through, I would challenge those of you who are more experienced to produce a better and more efficient attack. Um, and in there, there is also a massive data set um, of VBA code that I found. It's like nine gigs of VBA code. Um, so if you want, go through this code would work um, the same, and you could get your name on that leaderboard for um, <laughs> CVEs for machine learning systems. Um, so if you want to do that, you can go for it. Um, so feel free to ask questions in Discord. There's, there are no dumb questions. Um, and you know we have three TAs that are helping me out here. Um, so if you have you know specific questions, we can ask for it. Um, so hopefully you have the the link you have everything um, so effectively this is the uh, what do you call this this is the work workshop um, and there are two two files two Python notebooks one's the solutions and one is the workbook um, and you should start with the workbook if you do get stuck or you need code help or you just want to grab it and go um, the solutions one is going to work for you um, this amzi.h file is if you do want to compile the amzi stream.exe so you can recreate the full attack path um, you're going to need this header file um, the collect.py is, is what we use to gather all the information and then this insights.xlsx this excel file um, this is the version one of 
the insights that we pulled out of Defender. Um, so this would be like that, that proof point um, <laughs> style insight. And, you know, it is our version one. So this is it. So obviously you can see, you know, there's a lot of binary blobs in here. Um, but these would be the most malicious tokens. Um, and this makes sense to me. Code command. Um, and at the bottom, you have the least, you have a giant binary blob. Um, and then at the bottom, you have the least, you know, malicious commands or I shouldn't say commands, most least malicious tokens. Um, yeah. So there's that, it's free. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so you guys can get started. Um, do you guys have any questions right away? Uh, I haven't seen any questions so far. Perfect. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> is there, is anyone else getting four or three? I have to say, I haven't used binder. Binder. Um, is anyone else getting four or three? We are not seeing any chat on Twitch or Discord. I just reopened the link and it's building the container for me. Okay. Yeah, me too. Okay, that's good. Um, I have my own uh, copy. I am in the uh, the Jupyter notebook. Nice. Um, yeah. So the the first little bit. Um, just I'm gonna I'll give you guys like 10, 15 minutes to to rip through the first little bit. Um, and if you guys have questions. You know, let me know. Remote is always a bit weird. But, you know, it always gets me in the mood. Can you guys hear that? What always, what gets you in the mood? <laughs> Tron. Yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to stream copywritten music on here. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, Twitch doesn't really have a problem with that, but the YouTube vlog at the end will be uh, removed. That's fair. Yeah, I don't, don't spend that much time on the internet, so... Uh, so, Will, I can send you the notebook link again, the one that uh, myself and other people are using on the chat. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I have uh, I have my own. Excellent. Okay, so you guys, I'm just going to talk. Um, everything's pretty self-explanatory um, in terms of the um, instructions. So, can you zoom in a little bit? It's kind of hard to see on the screen. Is that better? Uh, one more. That should be good. Sorry, there's a one-year-old. I can see it very clearly. Um, excellent. So I'm just going to talk. You guys feel free to, to run through. Um, so sort of the basis of this attack is is really the any scan any malware scan interface. Um, and AMSI is something they introduced in, I want to say PowerShell 5, a little sooner than that. Um, but effectively, it's just a DLL that gets called into um, PowerShell, UAC dialogs, um, any JScript, VB script, 
um, and now .NET um, 4.8 and beyond. Um, and inside, um, it has a number of blacklisted functions um, that whenever one of those functions is called, uh, AMSI will get called to scan content. Um, and AMSI is not a, it's not a security boundary. It's not a security product. It's, it's an interface. And so all it does is collect output or sorry, collect whatever content is being put into the buffer or the string and it passes it back to an AMSI provider. And the AMSI provider then has an opportunity to scan the content and make some determination. So obviously this workshop is about Windows Defender, um, but there are several other um, there are several other providers, AMSI providers, that this attack would work against. Um, and that's, I suppose, kind of the nice part about machine learning currently is there's a lot um, of attack surface. So once uh, an AMSI provider, you know, scans the content and it decides what it is, there's, you know, a range of scores it can give. Currently it only gives back, um, zero or one three thirty two seven six eight um but in microsoft's documentation they talk about a range of scores so if you think rather than a hard label as a zero or a one eventually you'd get some sort of um regression type continuous variable continuous um yeah continuous variable on the out and so you'd get you know some heuristic i suppose Um, there is a great talk by, um, actually Microsoft, called, uh, Badly Behaving Scripts. It's probably like an hour and, probably an hour long. Um, but I think they gave it two years ago at Blue Hat um, IL. And in it, it, it's two engineers from the machine learning team. And they're just discussing <laughs> kind of how MZ works, the things that they're looking for. The things that they are um, kind of the kind of models that they're building and so on, and so this is kind of our first indication, at least officially, that you know machine learning was being pushed onto the client, um, and I think it it would seem anyway that um, overtly malicious things get stopped on the client, but anything that's kind of in between. Uh, seems to take, you know, seems to go to the cloud. Um, one way to test this would be to have some sort of timing attack. You could get the response times for submission to the reception of a score, and you could maybe see if um, there was a significant difference between, you know, the worst scripts and the, the medium bad scripts. Um, so, uh, moving on, you guys can obviously read, but, um, <clears throat> so the first thing we obviously need to do to, to create a copycat is we needed a, um, a data set, and there's a talk by Lee Holmes and Daniel Bohannon in 2017 um, called Revoke Obfuscation, PowerShell Obfuscation Detection Using Science, um, and in there they, they basically, so Daniel Bohannon wrote um, Invoke Obfuscation, which basically takes a script or you know any number of, of different languages, and it puts it through um, an obfuscation. So you know it it breaks it up into a million different pieces. Um, so it'll break those regexes that you know those, those brittle detections. Um, it's awesome awesome tool. Um, but these guys wrote it wrote the talk, and part of that research they collected like two gigs worth of PowerShell scripts. Um, and they <laughs> labeled them um, both benign and malicious for us. Uh, and so they were already, you know, you can actually, the link's here, um, so you can go pull it down and, and rip through it. Uh, <clears throat> once you have that, you, you know, the rest of it is just getting uh, target uh, outputs from the target model. So, you know, if, if we want to create a copycat, we want to know what Defender thinks of each script that we give it and then you know 
that is we modeled the model. So we have the inputs and we have the outputs. We don't know what's in the middle. We don't know that black box, but you know, we can infer it, you know, through, with our own model. Um, and you'll never get 100% of the model, but you might, you know, get just enough to, you know, bypass uh, Windows Defender, you know, for a month or just one time or whatever it might be. But the nice part about machine learning and the, the, the struggle that machine learning has, I think, is, is it does introduce a probability into what used to be a, a static decision. Um, yeah. The large repository of something interesting is VBA. So that's just nine gigs of Excel macros that you could do the same with, um, which would be pretty awesome. We have, um, let's see, what is this? This is the, this is the, um, <laughs> you're not on Windows. Um, if this were like a lab lab, we'd have like Windows VMs and we do this like for real. The, this is just the output from the AMSI stream. So invoke WMI backdoor looks malicious, but Defender doesn't think it's malicious. So if you look down, um, you see scan result is one, is malware zero, is malware is the, is the official um, feedback loop. And, you know, even in that, in that talk that is above, they discuss the fact that you can't trust file names. And that makes sense. You can't trust headers anymore. Um, there's some research I did a number of, like three years ago now, um, against mail filters where you would null out the first two bytes of a .m file. And depending on how the mail filter um, decided what kind of file it was, it would either you know block it or it let it through because it can't read the magic bytes at the top. Um, and then <laughs> obviously the document's corrupt at that point, but what Windows does is when you open the docm file is it would ask you to repair it. Um, and if you, you know, if the user clicked yes, so I'd like to repair this document, um, you know, your macro would live and you would, could get code execution. Um, right, but the next bit is the provider display name. So we have, you know, Microsoft Defender Antivirus. Um, if this is, um, if Defender's turned off for whatever reason, uh, or there is no AMZ provider, it'll give you a, an error uh, and you will not get a score back. Uh, the next piece is just power view. So power view is pretty well known script and it is definitely, well, I, it's not explicitly malicious, but it is used by malicious people. That's not fair to say. Um, it's used by attackers. I'm sure there are some nice attackers. Um, so in this lab, there are, uh, <laughs> Uploading 380,000 scripts to GitHub was not popular with GitHub. Um, so in this little bit, you only have 3,000, but the collect.py has everything you need. And when we were parsing, you know, we just did um, in your data, you have data clean and dirty. Um, these would be your malicious scripts. And clean scripts are obviously clean. There's like 3,000. There are about 1,200 malicious scripts that you can look at. Um, yeah, if you guys want to start ripping through this code. Um, as we were parsing, you can look through collect.py, uh, but I personally like to keep, so there's a lot of uh, moving parts, machine learning. You just, you kind of can't get away from it. Um, so whenever possible, I kind of like to keep at each step, you know, I'll build a data structure and I'll keep the previous output. Um, and I think that it works nicely. Most of my data sets are pretty small anyway. Um, so it's, it's manageable. Um, but you can kind of see the get screenshot. So this is the, the file name, the original file name. This is the hash, the MD5 hash of it. This, uh, and then you have the result being it's malware, um, and then you have the base64 encoded text. 
that. Uh, you can go and look through. I like this because if there's any weirdness, um, you have everything you need right in front of you. You don't have to go, you don't have to start again at, at, in a particular point. You don't have to go back to the beginning of the process. Um, you know, being able to debug all the way through your pipeline is, you know, it might cost you some speed, um, but at least for me, my, it's fine. You know, I'm not dealing with billions of anything, so. Um, yeah, we just got discussed lists. So if you're not familiar with a list, um, which I think probably most of you are. Raise your hand if you're familiar with lists. Nice, okay, so about 20% of you. <laughs> Can't hear any giggling. Um, all right, so you have lists. Uh, lists are like really nice, so you can just split them on any delimiter you want. Um, but you get them interesting. Uh, so quickly, quick question, Will. Uh, this is from uh, the Twitch chat. Um, should he be able to view the PowerShell code um, when they click in a, a file of clean or dirty, get a mess of characters, but not a script? Uh, yes. So you. So if you, yeah. So in this in this little code block here, um, you can open it, and it is. It is just a, so we've already parsed it for you. Um, it was just gonna take forever otherwise. Um, so what you're gonna see is the script name. So this is the original script name, the MD5 hash of the script content, um, the AMSI result, or should, I should say the defender result. So what defender thinks of the script. Um, and then the base64 encoded version of the script. So in, um, I don't know, can you turn lines? How do you turn lines on? That's my, anyway. Um, so in this bit, yeah, that's what we're doing here. So we're splitting, you know, a file. So we're, what we're doing is we're setting up, eventually we're gonna rip through all these, um, these files and we're gonna build a big vocab. Um, so this is a, this is, I just pulled one out as an example. Um, so let's see. So for example, if we want to reference, you know, this is just list stuff. So obviously zero index, so we can reference it however we want. Um, you can then reference with semicolon, you know, from index one to the end or from index one to the third and, you know, to the third. Um, or you can even do minus, so you can go to the end of the list and just get the, the script content. Um, but if we're going to look at the the script content, you know, we kind of want to know. Um, it's interesting that get screenshot um, is is counted as malicious. Um, so if we decode it, um, we can have a look and maybe. Maybe there's some knowledge that we have that we can think about as to why it might be malicious. Um, so we're just using split to make it a little nicer. And there's a typo right there. It's a double typo now. Um, all right, so we're just going to rip through it. Actually, no, it's not. <laughs> Um, so to make it nice, actually, this this isn't the solutions one, so you guys wouldn't know this. Um, so if you want to make it like a little nicer, we're just going to split it again, um, and we're going to get like a list of the um, things. So looking through this list, um, in my mind, the some of the more malicious things would be the add type assembly. Um, it would be convert to int32, new object, system IO memory stream, so everything like in memory attacks, um, any sort of memory stream is gonna be this. And then at the bottom, you also have two base64 string. Um, you know, I think base64 is typically something that gets picked up quite easily. Um, but if we wanted to figure out, you know, how this was, um, why this was malicious or why Defender um, 
thought this was malicious. Does anybody have any ideas that they want to type out? Is anybody typing? I can't see. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there is uh, anybody typing on Discord right now. Nice. Um, yeah, so we're just going to go through the dictionary. So, and, you know, this is just what I came up with. And it would be to try and determine the commonality, but, you know, between all the malicious scripts and see if, see what tokens, um, can, and when I say tokens, I mean words, uh, words came to the top. And to do this, we're going to use, we're just going to do a dictionary. Um, and it's kept, you know, uh, the key, key value pair. Um, so I'll let you guys run through that. And if you need to play around with dictionaries, they're pretty awesome. I like dictionaries. Um, but there is one other data structure that I like even more than dictionaries. Excellent. So we know what dictionaries are now. And we're just going to decode the content and we're going to add it all to a dictionary. Um, we're only going to do one script. Uh, and does anybody know why we might just only want to do one for now? Because it's a good practice. <laughs> yeah, it's good practice. But when you are dealing with, I don't know, thousands of scripts, like half a million scripts, if you have something that's going to mess up halfway through or you start down that path, um, that you're just going to waste a lot of time fixing errors. So if you can get it to work with one and then 10 and then... 50 and then a thousand, you know, I think that's a much better way to go about um, processing large data, uh, large data sets. So for this one, we're just going to do one, but um, we're going to split it twice and then we're going to just add um, everything to the uh, a word index. So there's a fill in your blank, a fill in the blank bit here. Um, so if you guys want to go ahead and run that code and then tell me what the issue is. And I'll give you clues. It's on the line with all the question marks. I didn't know that I need to be this close to the microphone. Or are you guys already way, way, way past this? It's not, well. So to get a proper count of the words as we go through them, we need to just add one. And you would have been able to tell after you went through it, because there is only one token listed for each. But the script has at least more than one. So, so if we just fix that. Now we get a better representation of what's out there. Um, Going one at a time, I guess I've found, you know, I used to have a real <laughs> issue with loops where I wouldn't um, break them up properly. And so doing it a little more slowly, um, at least one at a time has helped me. And then we're just going to sort the dictionary by token. So now, you know, this equal sign, there's nine of them, uh, there's six curly brackets, there's four new objects. Um, 
but nothing you know, particularly malicious. So there is a lot of punctuation in there, and um, but we'll, we can deal with that later. So now, because we're impatient and we just want to get to the machine learning bit, uh, we're going to run through the entire, um, all of the malicious scripts. And it might take a little bit on binder. <laughs> might even take a little bit here. The, um, <laughs> yeah. I wish I, I tried to ship all of the scripts to you. Um, okay, so now we're just gonna sort the words. So this is, this is all of the tokens for all of the malicious scripts. Um, and it isn't ideal. So there's a lot of numbers. Um, and I, this is fairly common when you're tokenizing text. Um, and I would generally just say go a little slow. But nice bit is we're seeing get proc address. Um, does anybody know, you know, in what operation get proc address might be used? Does anybody that works in an AV vendor know what get proc address might be used for? Uh, you can Google it if you want. No, nobody. GT. Any penetration testers? <laughs> Malware authors, anybody? I'm a data scientist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That That's fair. Um, well, I'll let you look that up. Um, but it's it's used typically when you're looking up fr functions in remote, in other DLLs. Um, most notably, I think used in um, process injection. Anyway, all right. So there's a lot of numbers. Uh, it's fairly classic. Um, but you know we're seeing write bytes to memory, memory address, a lot of malware type things, um, remote proc handle. Very, and obviously this is all PowerShell. Um, but the numbers are actually kind of annoying. So let's um, scroll through. Nah, I mean I'm. I'm. Are there any tokens in there that that um, are particularly interesting to anybody? Nope. Um, okay. Um, so. Rob, uh, logistic aggression managed to answer a question. Oh, sec. Thanks, Rob. Rob's the man. Uh, Twitch chat. Nice. What, what was it? Um, he said, you get the address of a DLL function in memory. Also heavily used in Packers. Yeah, exactly. Knew I could count on Rob. Um, okay, so the next bit. So we're just going to continue to filter down, um, and I would say that's that's generally the case with um, most of your data. I think most of your time spent <laughs> when you're doing machine learning isn't actually a machine, isn't the the bit, isn't the math piece that you typically think of. It's processing data. It's um, yeah, it's, it's processing data. It's filtering data. It's making sure that your data sets are balanced or um, have a distribution that you want or whatever it might be. You know, I said earlier that we're not inventing new math. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the guy to invent new math. Um, so you know, I the place that I can be most effective is using applying my domain knowledge to. You know what I know of machine learning and 
and being extra careful with my, my data. Um, there's a, Abraham Lincoln has a saying about sharpening an ax. Can't remember exactly what it is. Um, yeah, I was gonna cut down a tree. I'd spend the, if I had 10 hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first eight sharpening my ax. That sounds right, I could have made that up. Um, but I, the, the same is true for you know machine learning and I would say data science. Um, and I don't know if Comath, you wanna chime in there as, as a data scientist if that is true or not? Uh, yeah, I tend to get the, well, try something that works and then to go back and perfect it to make sure I don't get little mistakes because when you scale things up, it really uh, screws you when there's a bug 1.1% point, point <laughs> of the time. Now you have 100,000 things. The bug is, is guaranteed to happen. Uh, it's better to clean those up before you yeah. really. Yeah, and if, if I mean, if you're, uh, if you're a data scientist, like um, if in the Twitch chat, do you want to write what do you think the percentage of cleaning versus actual machine learning like data processing versus uh, machine learning. I think that would be interesting. Um, and if you're new to machine learning, I would say um, it's okay. I mean, yeah, no, it's okay to be impatient and like go really fast because you want to get the end result. But um, if you want to get quality results, um, it, it is better to go a little slower. Um, okay, so we're just going to create a new list, and the difference here is we're creating just a find all. So we're going to start removing some punctuation and numbers, um, and then we're just going to add it to a new list, uh, and then we're going to print the top 100 tokens. Um, so all the numbers are gone, a lot of the punctuation is gone. Um, I'd say that looks quite a bit better than the other one. Um, we can still see, we still have get proc address, we still have, um, you know, so we're still seeing the malicious tokens that we would expect, shell code. Um, and so we haven't, you know, completely ruined our, our, what I'm going to call <laughs> I want to call them crispy bits, um, but we haven't ruined our, what we want to model effectively, um, right by its memory. So that's also there. Um, so this bit, I, yeah, I just said pick some tokens and, and go Google them um, and make sure that, you know, they're, see what comes up. Um, that, that's kind of the fun bit. I suppose we are live, I can do that. Uh, let's see. That's what PE handle does. Do you guys use... Oh, I'm using edge. That that's embarrassing. Hmm. Do you guys have you guys heard of Mimi Cats? Do you know if that one's malicious? Yeah, I would say so. Um PowerShell type Mimi Cats is swagged as malicious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely malicious. Um, and I would say, I don't know, as an operator, I think a lot of the industry uses a lot of the same uh, scripts. So, yeah, in fact, the DLL injection, book DLL injection at Graber. Um, yeah, so these these are these are malicious type scripts. Um, okay, so once once we have that bit, um, you know, you could we could stop here, right? So we have some malicious tokens that um, we know that you know these are all tokens or words that were labeled as defend by Defender as malicious. So we could stop here theoretically and have malicious scripts that never, you know, don't use any of these words. Um, alternatively, you could do the same with the clean scripts and only use, you know, words from those clean scripts, or, you, you know, you could do both. Um, but that, and I think that would probably work, um, but I think you would have a hard time making it uh, repeatable, and you wouldn't necessarily, you know, if something, if it all of a sudden stopped working, I don't think you would have 
uh, much recourse and being able to figure out how or why. Um, and so I think this is kind of where machine learning shines for us. And it's just the ability to iterate through massive amounts of data extremely quickly. So, you know, while I'm going to use the, the GPT-2 phishing analogy, and it's like, you can spend an hour crafting, you know, one fish for five targets, or you could spend an hour correcting five unique fish generated out of GPT GPT two for five targets. Um, GPT two G language models aren't perfect, um, but they do help scale. You know, so it's like you generate five of them, and you can correct them, make them seem you know, realistic and not sound terrible. Um, in the same time, you could to do one. So, you know, in terms of pulling out insights from Windows Defender, I think that's also true. All right. So we're getting to we got to the machine learning bit, um, and in in this manual, you know, we reference three hundred eighty thousand scripts. Um, there are I think four hundred and ten in the whole. Piece. So in that PowerShell uh, link at the top, you know, it has that many. Um, we just use, I just chose the biggest folder that had them in there. Um, and then introduce them to Insight. Anyway. So we're going to get into some of the data representation. Um, I think data representation is probably my favorite part of machine learning. Um, it's really where you get to shape, um, kind of shape the output and shape, not the model, because the model has its own architecture, but you, you get to encode and embed your domain knowledge um, when you, you know, I guess it would be called, uh, Sven, correct if I'm wrong, but you, you'd call it feature engineering. Um, and that piece is, is extremely important so you know if you want to um, the outputs of your model or the accuracy of your model is a direct um, representation correlation with the quality of your data representation and your feature engineering um, and it's yeah it's my favorite part okay so um, GT went through tokenization earlier this uh, earlier today, um, but to we've we've already kind of played with tokenization. But tokenization is effectively the process um, of splitting, you know, the the words into separate words. So, you know, each each um, <laughs> losing it um, not into separate words. You piece out sentences into a list. So. Once we have a tokenizer, um, rather than we could write it ourselves, but um, like we did up here, um, but I would imagine there's probably better developers out there, and I trust uh, I trust them probably more than I trust my own code for some for some stuff. Um, but if you imagine this corpus, so if you imagine this corpus is actually just our our big PowerShell list, so each line is a PowerShell script. Um, you know, it's just a list of it, and we're gonna fit on text, and this is just to create an index. Um, so we're just creating those data structures, um, and you can see, you know, each uh, each word gets its own sequence uh, integer. And you know, in terms of sequential numbers, like in a text prediction scenario, like sequences are really nice because um, you can say, you know what number comes after what, and then you can go back to your index and look it up. Um, yeah, so if we can go, my cat likes mittens. Um, these are, I don't have a cat, but I assume cats like mittens. Or most cats are called mittens. Um, but we're just taking the first index and we're, we're tokenizing it. Um, yeah, 
Six more cats. It's, it's, yeah, it's a word index. It's fairly straightforward. Um, and there are a number of ways to represent text. Um, you have machine learning models that'll do it. You have um, frequency uh, models. You have uh, TF-IDF, which is term frequency inverse document frequency, um, which is like a weighted frequency. Uh, what else do you have? Um, what am I missing? Obviously, one hot encoding. That's where we're going to go next. Um, so, one hot encoding is basically it's a vector, which is the length of your vocabulary, and the presence of a, a token or a word is um, denoted by a one. And if it doesn't exist in a document, then it's a zero. And so, what you end up getting is uh, let's see how long is there. Well, it's only 17. So each vector is going to be um, 17 integers long. And the array is going to look like this. So this is just the first sentence. But as we go through, um, you know, you'll see as the words change, um, you get different, uh, what do you call this? I guess not indications, activations. It's probably incorrect. Um, you get different, yeah, indications. Anyway, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, and let's see, the nice part about one hot encoding is that you, I guess, take you, you do get every token in um, one, so they're well represented. They you, you do get some sparsity, so if you have a lot of, like, a really big corp, you know, a really big corpus or vocabulary, um, you get some sparsity in there. Um, but it's really nice if you only care about the, the presence of a word. It does not, um, it doesn't necessarily keep the semantics or the syntax or, um, you know, it's, it's not very good for text prediction, it is good for um, classification, which is kind of what we want to do. All right, so now we kind of have an idea what tokenization does and the tokenization scheme that we're going to use. We're going to get into my favorite um, data structure, which is named tuples. Um, named tuples are immutable, well, they're, they're tuples, but you can, they're like immutable classes. Um, so you can kind of create them, you can set your, you know, your variables to whatever you want, and it's really nice because then you can turn around and reference a tuple, or reference a variable inside of a tuple by name, um, which makes your code read a lot cleaner than if you were just going to use a uh, tuple or a list or even a dictionary. Dictionaries can be, um, I actually don't know the speed difference between dictionaries and native tuples. Does anybody know? There's any? Maybe not. Um, but this is an example for name tuple. I, you know, it's like, you know, when you find something you like and you just use them absolutely everywhere. That This is where I'm at with name tuples. Um, just because they're super nice. All right. So this code, um, we are going to kind of create our training structure. So this is, you should be familiar with everything in this code block by now. So we are, um, we have our filter, you know, there, the tokenizer has a filter attached to it. Um, if you want to use that one, we're going to create a primary list to hold uh, all of our training data. And then we're going to hold a, we're going to create a list that will, that we're going to use for tokenizing. Um, and this is kind of, Eventually, you know, when, when you start building these small pieces, eventually there's a point where they kind of all come together and you can transition from processing into learning. And this script here is, is where we do that. So, you know, all of a sudden we can, I shouldn't say script, but um, so we've built all these tiny pieces out and you can kind of see how they're coming together. And there's, there's two really important things happening. Um, in this little code block, 
um, obviously the, the tokenization is happening um, and we are collecting all of the uh, all of the named tuples so I know named tuples so we're gonna go through every uh, malicious script um, we're gonna decode it as we did before we're gonna remove all the punctuation we're gonna split it we're gonna unique it um, I did this because I assume it makes tokenization faster um, but I don't as I said I don't have any evidence for that it just seemed to make sense um, maybe you guys could try it and let me know we are going to then you know, rejoin the unique tokens uh, unique words in a sentence and we're just going to add them to a name tuple um, and then add that name tuple to a list so the important piece here is the label um, and you know for malware the label is a one and then for um, clean labels are a zero so this is where we're kind of creating our, our training st structure um, the other piece you might notice is originally we had 380,000 scripts that we ran this on um, for this demonstration this workshop that GitHub didn't really like it um, so we only gave you 3,000 but you know that's still like a two to one but when you're having 380,000 scripts versus almost 1200 scripts you know your data is very um, unbalanced so if you for example were to do a similar scheme as we did um, earlier with just the malicious scripts we did it for both um, what might end up happening is your clean script words will start to um, <laughs> the word isn't drown out. Uh, what's the word, Eric? Spin. What's the technical term? I'm going to say drown out. Um, or average out. Whatever it might be. It's like if your GPA is really bad, eventually you just can't get it up. Anyway. All right, so and then at the end of this, so the outcome of this is we're going to get a list that has uh, all of our named tuples that are ready for to be processed, to be fed into a model. And then we're going to have uh, all of our documents that are ready to be tokenized. So at the end of this, we're just going to build the vocab, and we're going to have everything. Um, this is a little blurb. So it takes a little bit to go through all of them. that also you guys will probably know this but um, if you guys use vim it creates a swap file so I help some <laughs> help debug some issues with um, where they were they were opening their data files inside of a folder and running Python out of the same folder and so their Python was like trying to tokenize their text and they couldn't figure out the error and it was just because uh, they were trying to read a swap file. The more you know. Anyway, all right. So now we have our, our vocab, I hope. Yep. Um, and we can kind of see the tokens that came out. So these are the, um, after our filtering, um, you know, the closer you get to training, you want to be you know, you want to be increasingly happy with what you're seeing in terms of um, the, the words or the tokens. And I think that you know, I'm more happy with this than when we started. Um, but, you know, definitely play by ear. But it, it is useful to take a moment and, and see. Just take a look. Um, you know, remote DLL handle. Um, just take a look because it's going to be useful. There's quite a lot of them. Mm. So... This is something I haven't dealt with, and you can see in the insights.xls, but if you were going to deal with it, this is probably how you would do it. Um, so you just want to do a regex for this TVQQAAMA. Does anybody know what that is? 
that Rob does. I see you're binging it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the this is embarrassing. <laughs> Bing, the best way to Google. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, that's you'd want to remove those, obviously. Um, I didn't. It indicates that it is a PE file. Yeah. Um, usually, yeah, compressed or embedded in in some other medium. Um, okay, so now we're at the point where we are, well, I already described this bit. Um, if you're not familiar with machine learning at all whatsoever, um, there's a, um, a little video series by, uh, what's his name? I don't know, but his YouTube channel is 3Blue1Brown. It's just like four videos an hour. It is, it's, it's really good. It's going to be way better than I will ever be able to explain um, machine learning to you. Um, so I, I recommend having a look through that. Um, you know, watch it a couple times. And if you're really into math, he has a lot of cool stuff. Like, yeah, his, he does, his animations are really good. But um, neural networks, you know, we've all, we've kind of all seen this picture. Um, but our input layers represent our input data or our, you know, one hot encoded text. Hidden layers, you know, represent an activation function. Um, and the output layer or node is the result um, of the network or classification or prediction, whatever it might be. Um, there are a lot of... <laughs> machine learning is more than this little picture that we see everywhere. Um, and I would say this is like the tiniest little bit um, of machine learning. And even inside of this picture, of the mechanics that are going on um, you know, are, are quite extensive. Uh, and that's, this is just like the most vanilla machine learning um, implementation. So I think the nice part, you know, the nice part about Keras and, and whatever the frameworks is they bring, you know, that kind of uh, ability and, and power to non-mathematicians or non, uh, what do you, what do you call non-mathematicians, Sven? Uh, I, I don't. Is there an industry word for them, you know, like? Uh, I'm trying students. to be like, hey, what? Students. Students. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Normies. Normies. Yeah. I mean, honestly, we just don't think about non. Yeah. I, I don't want to dig myself into a hole here. <laughs> you got too much math to think about. No, no, As I a non mathematician, it. I take great offense to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So lay I, people you know. is right. Yeah. Rich has got it right. Lay people. Yeah, lay people. Um, and if you are, um, I think the first book I read was Make Your Own Neural Network by Tariq Rashid. Um, and that was, it was just the most, it was like 120 pages. It was just the most basic, most straightforward um, explanation of a, of a neural network. You know, I think there's, there's a bajillion tutorials out there, and I think they are okay, but, you know, they always, they're always so quick to get into a framework without actually explaining what's going on underneath. Um, and that, that is definitely a hindrance. Like you, you don't have to be a mathematician to use machine learning, but you should at least spend time learning the basics. Um, okay. So let's see. You have a little explanation of machine learning. We have our training set. We're happy with the tokenization to a point, um, happy enough for now anyway, you know, eventually, you know, I think you always want to be moving forward. So you always kind of want to be thinking in pipelines. So I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't spend too much time necessarily in one area, but when you build it, make it such that it is modular and can be like put into it, into a, um, into a pipeline. Um, let's see. So now we need to tokenize all the documents. Uh, 
and this will take a list. Which I think docs is. We'll find out. Nice, and then we can let's just double check. That's good. All right, and now we're going to create our our score array. So here we have. <laughs> So this is a name tuple that we're going to go through. So we're referencing um, e, which is a terrible variable name. I'm sorry, but all text is the where it, is the list that's holding all of our name tuples. Um, and if this is a this is called list comprehension. Um, another another favorite of mine. Um, it like creates a list. Put a function inside of square brackets, and it'll create you a list. Um, but you can see we're referencing the label, so we're just going to create a score matrix. And actually, you can see what that looks like. Um, but there's giant arrays. Um, and the reason they're giant arrays is because um, mechanics of um, machine learning is kind of would you say rooted in matrix multiplication? No, because that will ignores all of the decision trees and a bunch of other kind of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Kanier's narrative rules and a bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This so yeah. When I was talking about like the this picture being kind of dumb, it's the only picture we ever see, and it's like the smallest. It's just one of the smallest pieces. Um, there's so much more out there um, that you should look at, and I probably could have introduced you to. Anyway, so now we have our score matrix. Um, actually, now I'm looking at this. So these are all our labels. Um, so when the uh, when the network's learning, um, you know it's going to calculate a loss. So it's going to have an input, um, and then at the end of that, it's going to take whatever the label was and see how close it was to the label. So a large loss is bad, and a small loss is good. Um, and through gradient descent and back propagation. Um, the network will update the weights, you know, such that the next time it sees or, you know, there's something, you know, a label like that, it'll hopefully be closer. And we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so, <laughs> I like this. This is part of my parallels. Um, <laughs> so, tabs versus spaces, nano versus VS code. Um, messy versus that other guy. Uh, machine learning frameworks are no different. So, do you guys have preferences for machine learning frameworks? Like what? Like why do you? Um, why do you choose the machine le learning framework you do? Um, I use PyTorch because it tends to look more like real code than TensorFlow, uh, but Keras is like super easy to get up and running so it's a good choice but yeah and then when you do the real world stuff i reach into a, a, a compiled language like rust or c oh c that's brave um has anybody used ml.net did anybody know ml.net existed no depends on what you want to do Actually, and they have a Win32, so DirectX, um, there's a Win32 machine learning implementation. Actually, it's not an, it's it's just an interface for TensorFlow on X models. Yeah, um, yeah I, I prefer Keras, you know, it's simple. Like I think if all the math is the same, then you know, you're really just looking at what you prefer. Um, and yeah, this is what I, yeah, the Keras, Keras is good. To get off the ground, but it 
may limit your customization. Um, and I think that's exactly what an API, it, it doesn't limit you, it abstracts um, complexity. So I think the reason Keras is so easy to use is because it does a really good job of abstracting complexity, but if you want that complexity and you want to dig in, it's still there for you. Um, you just have to, to potentially dig a little deeper um, versus something like PyTorch, which is um, is pretty raw, um, I would say. Probably, that's probably not true. I mean, some guy in the back's yelling about MATLAB right now. Oh, MATLAB, that's <laughs> a whole other fact of words. We all have a, bit of, uh, a little bit of PTSD about it. Yeah. Don't ever say Matt. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Rich is saying uh, PyTorch is, uh, you know, Keras is good for 99% of your projects, and then PyTorch, when you're getting freaky, and I say PyTorch is good for 90% of your projects, and Rust when you're getting freaky. Uh, there's also Jax, all sorts of stuff. Oh, so. yeah, Jax. Does anybody use Jax? Do they like it? I know Jason. See in here? Yeah, it's kind of yes, the Wild West, have... I would say. Like, yeah. Yeah. You there's a bajillion different frameworks. Everybody uses something different. Um <laughs> Yeah, I know. I like I like TensorFlow. It has TensorFlow serving. It seems to have a good like uh ecosystem around it. Um yeah. but you obviously you make trade offs, right? But if if your verbiage and your fundamentals are good, then I think you could probably use just about any language with enough practice. Okay, so we're gonna create our model now. Um, and we're just gonna create, you know, it's the same as the picture effectively, but we're just gonna create it in code. Um, one thing we didn't talk about are activation functions. Um, or actually, I just didn't talk about a lot, but as inputs or as your data traverses from weights into hidden layers and hidden nodes, um, weights, as they change, they their job is to modulate inputs um, based on, sorry, modulate, yeah, modulate inputs based on their inputs, um, such that the output is is relative. Um, sorry, I saw some in the chat. Um, so we're just use sigmoid. I think. Sigmoid super simple. It's a good place to start. Um, the other, I don't know, what are some other other favorites? I know Relu is like has replaced Sigmoid. Um, yeah. Is there a good reason for this, or is is there? Does everybody kind of like, uh, oh, this is better, so we're going to use it all the time now? Um, so the Relu paper was originally basically said. ReLU gets better accuracy scores than Sigmoid, and they just compared that across a bunch of things. And for images, it tends uh, ReLU tends to have a high, higher accuracy rate of score than uh, Sigmoid does. And that's basically why it won, is because on images, you can easily <laughs> show that it's better. Nice. Um, I don't know whether it's concretely better in all situations because of that. So it's, you're showing your age with Sigmoid here. Yeah, well, yeah. it also uh, Relu also handles the disappearing um, differential. If I remember that correct. Gradient or disappearing gradient, yeah, vanishing gradient. Or if you go too far into the negatives or too far into the positives, you're never gonna crawl yourself back out. Yeah. yeah. And then there's leaky Relu that help that tries to help that even more. And, uh... and there's Elu who tries to say, "Hey guys." You could be Relu, you could be Leaky Relu. Let's just combine the two. And so I think it never goes below negative one as a weight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think this is um, actually, like, I like this discussion. I don't know how many of you listening are machine learning people in, to begin with. Um, but as, and this is why the tutorials are kind of, they're nice to get you off the ground, but I think they're limiting in the fact that they're always using kind of the same architectures. So they're never, you know, to say, oh, this is good for this and this is good for this, and that's true. And you might end up there anyway like they are. Um, maybe there's just lessons they've learned that you haven't. 
Um, but I think it is important to explore um, different architectures, different losses, just play with um, play with the numbers. I think machine learning is ultimately about iteration and experimentation at scale. And that includes activation functions, that includes output nodes, that includes just any, any lever you can pull. Um, you should pull it and, and see what happens. Um, and so also, the as an engineer, sort of as a data scientist, you should learn pull the levers and see what happens, because you might find that on like security data, sigmoid works better than ReLU in this case. And if you never tried sigmoid because you just go with standard ReLU, uh, you'd never learn that. So uh, read everything and try everything. Hang out, hang out at AI Village super smart people just hang out at um, general club and just be a little fly on the wall that's what i do um okay so we're gonna create our model now one thing we need to do is we need to put our documents our our, our uh what do you call it our vectors um into our model and when i was first starting this is actually one of the harder pieces that i had to fit my brain, I think uh, that's true, is just um, the shape um, the shape of arrays and how they get introduced into to models. Um, does anyone in the chat want to take a stab at what these three question marks should be? We can try it live. I'm, I'm hung up on the missing parentheses. Hey, you're right. Yeah, but Rich has got to write the, the feature size. Yeah, exactly. Let's see, what is that? That would be... Pretty sure it's your matrix dot shape yeah. variable. that you guys Google constantly. Sorry, you guys must be uh, probably missing some imports. I'll push a new version. All right, so if you're missing those imports, you're gonna wanna add them. Super simple. Um, the text matrix, the input dim that we're doing is an array of, uh, let's see, probably like 80,000, 86,000 tokens. So, you know, across this, you're going to see, um, 
it's going to look obviously like this. So we just have, I think, 1,200 samples times, you know, 80,000 tokens long. And we're just going to feed it then. Nice. Um, and then we're going to do a test train split. Um, in, when you build a model, you obviously have test data and you want to keep some test data out. Um, but the idea is eventually that your model will be deployed into the real world where it's not going to be trained on, it's not going to be seeing test data necessarily. So ideally you want to keep some data away or out of your, your training set. Um, so that when it sees real data, you, or when it sees data it hasn't seen before, um, it can make a you know, hopefully an accurate guess. Um, so splitting them out um, for that reason. I, I've heard you guys talk about um, like training leaking, um, leaking into your training data during training. How does that happen? Uh, so if you don't, one of the ways it could happen is uh, if you are, uh, you could have duplicate samples that are uh, like, normally you just say, hey, pick a random set of indices or pick the last 20% of my indices. Uh, and that's my test set. Or you do a cross validation fold where you like divide it up somehow. Uh, and if you had duplicate data, say like the last 20% of your data was actually duplicated with the first 20% of your data, and you trained on uh, the first uh, four fifths, and then you tested on the last one fifth. Well, it, since it's duplicated, it's included in your training set, and you do really well. Uh, so you have to make sure that you don't have that sort of issue. And then there's other little things that you could have. Um, uh, it's basically a data cleaning issue uh, a lot of the times, and then sometimes it's a weird bug in your code. Sometimes. Sometimes you can just reverse the model itself, and it'll say, you'll say, oh, show me uh, what this looks like, and then it'll just print out an example from the training set. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have early stopping twice. Early stopping um, is super nice. So if you, know, you have a really long-running task and your, your model's not improving, early stopping will just stop your model. Um, Part of me doesn't like it, and I just feel like it could some get better. Um, but this is a tiny model, so we're not that interested. We, we don't really mind. Um, Chris and I just give callbacks, so if you want to use TensorBoard, whatever. Um, batch size, this would be the frequency at which um, updates to the weights will happen. Um, epochs, this is just time we're going to do. Sorry, the number of times that we're going to you know, run through. Um, and we can train. Um, <laughs> it's obviously seems pretty accurate. I don't know. It, I haven't actually tried to optimize this at all. Um, but what do you guys do when, um, you know, model trains really accurately at first? You think it's beneficial that a you would train you would try and overfit a model at first because that would at least indicate it could learn something. Yeah, uh, Rich and I both get very paranoid when the thing does too well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a you've got an accuracy of one hundred percent, but something's wrong. Something <laughs> must be wrong. Yes, something is wrong. Um, I'm mean, gonna so it's probably. There could be any number of things. Um, this one says version one, uh, and you know I think I gave you the I'm giving you the code so you can go and uh, you know recreate the model, do whatever you need to, and I would love to see um, I'd love to see I don't know some blog post or some write up about everything I missed. Um, so this is a visualization of training loss. Um, obviously, with the, the gradient going down, you would like to see this going down. If this were inverted, um, that would indicate that, well, it could indicate a number of things, but um, either it's not learning or it's overfitting. 
and it's stopped learning completely. Uh, and then we have some evaluation metrics. Um, and if it, obviously, it's going to be like, yeah, I did really well on this, um, as we saw up here. So that's a little suspect. Um, but, you know, even after you have a model, um, I like to pull out, you know, a couple of the best and worst examples of a, of a category. So, you know, we're just taking the first um, malicious document in our, in our, because we, we, what do we do? We put them in a list such that they were, you know, malicious and then non-malicious. So we're taking the first, we're taking the second um, malicious document, and then we're going to take the last non-malicious, and we're just going to try and predict and see what they are. And yeah, they're um, a little too accurate <laughs> for my liking, um, but you know, that's, that's kind of it. Um, okay, so this is, this is kind of where we leave you. So the first, this Excel file that you're looking at here, when I did it on all 380,000 scripts, um, it took me, well, and this would be depend on whatever kind of potato you're running, but um, it took me 17 hours to do. Um, so we're probably not gonna run it here, or you can, you might already be running it, um, been having reset a few times because you thought your thing froze. Um, but effectively what we're doing is we're just toggling absolutely every um, possible combination and then making a base prediction and then a new prediction. Um, and then we're keeping a cumulative sum um, of those. And what you end up getting is a spread of um, scores across you know a number of uh, predictions that will sort your tokens into malicious and non-malicious. Um, this is the same code from the proof point research. The proof point research was easier in this regard because they had a wider, um, you know, they had a range of 1 to 999, where these are hard labels and it says 0 or a 1. Um, but, you know, as a first run through, you know, looking at the most malicious and the least malicious tokens, you know, without any optimization, if it were ever going to work, I would expect, um, I would expect to see that, you know, at least they're being sorted um, to some degree, because now you can go back and you can start, you know, tweaking the model or, or whatever it might be, um, you know, to really pull out, really, I don't know, hone in on what's accurate. I think a lot of times for attackers, like this first version would be just fine. Um, but, you know, if you, as you go into the future, um, you know, you could even do this. You could always be collecting data. And um, actually, I remember <laughs> after my first B-Sides talk about machine learning last year, um, Rob came up to me and was like, hey, you, you, should, uh, you should have a separate... Um, data gathering campaign um, so you keep your ops and your you know your data collection separate but your data collection can support your ops and it doesn't necessarily um, burn um, burn you because collecting data is, can be noisy um, so it is a bit over time but do you guys have any questions um, comments what I would love to see is someone to take this defender model and absolutely crush it. Um, I didn't, I mean, it's a tiny model. I'm not sure Microsoft would care that much. The There's a VBA, this VBA data, data set I have not touched. Um, so if you guys want to race to whatever, um, I'd love to see what comes out of it. Um, I, I appreciate everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, hit me up in the Slack or not Slack, Discord if you have any questions um, or you just want to rag on my terrible code. Um, that's fine too. But I will end it there. Anyway, so I think this is, this is the last stream of the night. So we're closing out the Twitch stream now. Uh, tomorrow hopefully we'll go smoother. We learned some things today. But I'll see you guys all in the morning, hopefully.
<laughs> Hopefully.